Yes, welcome again to the Orkney Viking Week 2021. Um, I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Nikolaus tonight. Kanzel. Nikolaus studied medieval history and then went on to do a postgraduate, uh, a master's degree in Viking studies at Nottingham, where his supervisor was Judith Yesh on Thursday. Um, so Nicolaus's master's research focuses on Orkney Saga. He chose that because he's visited Orkney many times growing up and got very interested in Orkney's history. So he chose Orkney Saga as his topic for the master's thesis, which I have read and I must say it was very, very good. So I invited him to join us at the Vikings Festival and share his research with us. I'm so glad you could come, Nikolaus. Now, over to you. Thanks, Raggy. Um, I'll just try to uh, share my screen. Uh, somehow, hang on. There we go. Uh, can can we all see the uh, my presentation? Oh, awesome. Right. Um, so yeah, this this topic kind of uh, it develops from my master's dissertation. So I was I was reading Orkney and Saga. Um, it's it's, if you're studying saga literature, it's, it's quite good to read sagas over and over again. You you, you can kind of read between the lines. You, you can carry between the lines. Yeah, I, I was reading the saga. I was, I was thinking about a particular character uh, called Halcom Poulton. And he's he's known in the saga for causing quite a lot of conflicts between, between the earls, his, 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 uh, his father, his uncle. And I noticed when I was when I was going through an Old Norse version of the text that it describes him as an, an upstopper matter which is an overbearing man. And I, I brought up to my lecture and point, pointing more towards uh, this uh, PhD in 2016 from uh, Joanne Short Butler. It was a study of uh, transgressive characters. And uh, from there, it really uh, it just developed into a, a legal topic. And uh, I figured that this one PhD topic about transgressive characters didn't mention Orkney. And yet there's plenty of plenty of action that happens in Orkney Saga. And I, I found this was the case of the, with a few other law centre studies as well that, that focus on Iceland and Norway. And, you know, there's no mention of Orkney Saga. It's perhaps one of the, the lesser known sagas. And uh, I found that, at least, at least to the best of my knowledge, the last time that someone attempted to construe aspects of, of law from the saga was in uh, 1913 by a chap called Alfred Johnson, who wrote in the, it's called the, the Orkley and Shetland uh, record series. Um, you, can, you can find that on the Viking Society for Northern Research websites. Um, and it, it, yeah, it just, it sort of uh, kicked off from there. I'm just trying to, see. oh, there we go. So yeah, just, to, uh, just a little bit about, about the saga itself. Uh, if you saw Judith's talk uh, a few days ago, you, you'll know like it was uh, originally written maybe around the year 1200, but it's, it's been copied numerous, numerous times since then. And it only really survives in later versions, like the, the Flatio book. Um, so the, Im the image in the top right of the screen is the sort of, uh, kind of shows how complex all the different, the copies and versions are in relation to each other. And uh, the reason to to approach it via via legal via legal methodology is that the Vikings didn't have enacted law codes like we have them today, but they, they worked via recognised customary legal systems. And so, and you can you can take they had law codes, but they were almost kind of literary, um, in, in a similar way to the sagas, which are which are stories and history and le legal aspects of saga literature can reveal a lot about 
a saga's motivation for writing. You know, it's, a, it's a, another way of contextualizing Orkney within the Viking diaspora and all the links that interlink to the Viking world. And it'd be interesting to know what particular links you can find with Orkney, since it's pretty close to Iceland. Orkney and the saga was, was written in Iceland. You know, it was a, a Norwegian earldom, so there's going to be a lot of Norwegian influences. And it's also just a few miles from Scotland as well. So you've got quite a mix of, uh, of uh, customary influences going on. Um, and it's not, it's perhaps not, uh, not reflecting perhaps on the legal customs throughout the history that that the saga depicts. It was written a long time after the after the events occurred, but it's it's probably reflecting at least, if not the legal customs from the, the times it was written and copied, perhaps the the authors and copyists historical perspective on their own pasts. And uh, it's interesting that there are a lot of legal aspects in the sagas that they've, they've picked up on and have thought it's important enough to mention. So as a, as a, as a genre, it's, it doesn't really fit within any, any particular genre. In, in Iceland, you have the Eastland Ingesugar, which are the Icelandic sagas. And then you, and you also have the, the Kunungasugur, which are the, the king sagas, written mainly about the, the kings of Norway and Denmark. And uh, Orkney Inga saga is kind of, it's almost genreless, and it's, it's kind of on its own, more or less. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an area with strong influences. And um, just, for, just to, 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 define, to define what a transgression is as well, is something that will that comes up a lot in Orkney and the Saga, is it's it's a uh, it's basically an instance in which the the uh, a character oversteps the bounds for what's acceptable in a in a specific society, and it's measured by uh, by Keith Rooter's uh, PhD provided a model of uh, spectrum what's called spectrums of normativity, by which you can measure morals, law, and honour. Um, as, a, as an, an acceptable spectrum. So what's accept, uh, what is expect, acceptable is referred to as normativity. Anything that oversteps the bounds will be transgressive behavior. And I'll, it's, it's, not, it's not exactly just a legal thing because in this period, law isn't the only thing that matters. Just like today, law in a lot of senses is important as having good morals. Um, I don't think we have quite the same quite the same aspects of, of honour as they did back then, but that was a particularly important aspect of society as well. And, uh, and these, these, are, these, these, uh, these spectrums of honour, morals and law is a, is a way that we can spot transgression, because they, they didn't exactly use the word transgression in, in, these, in these cases. So you, we, can, we can spot them by the crimes and punishments and the, the settlements that came about. Yep, and this, and this is just uh, another important reason why approaches to law, approaches to law might be quite important. And this is, this is the, the modern application of uh, like such approaches. And without, well, they got, without getting too political or anything, on the left you can see uh, the website for the, the Soul Group, which is the, the Shetland and Orkney Oodle Law Group, which is a, it's a modern group that I, I think vies for for, ind uh, for independence, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how active they are, but it's just just an example that that law law and history can be used in modern politics. So, like the the first point to be made, you, you can see at the top it, it notes about the Shetland Council logo, and uh, if you if you visit the council, it it's it's the the right motto that they give. It, you can see it says, "With laws, land will be built." And it just really shows a, a modern consciousness in the Northern Isles of the legal past in, in that part of the world. Um, yeah, and on the right, you can see that uh, an act which came into, into use not that long ago, like with just, just over 20 years ago, the, the Abolition of Feudal Tenure Act. 
Um, and this this, affili this uh, officially abolished the, the feudal systems of land tenure in Scotland that have been in existence since the 12th century. And this includes uh, over law, which is essentially a kind of like Norse land rights that people were able to own their own land. Um, the act kind of refers to like things about like vassalage and peace will be people being vassals of each other, which is kind of like kind of like a sort of overlord, underlord kind of system. And it's something that's mentioned in Orkney in the Saga as well. But I just I've just found it quite, quite incredible that this act is only coming into play to abolish all these medieval legal customs only only 20 years ago. So you see, it's, it, it's definitely got modern modern applications. Uh, so you're going to go into what aspects of law you can construe from Orkney and the Saga. There are two attestations of uh, law being written. There's no mention of what was contained in these laws. Just it just it says in the saga that that Thorfinnur and Halcon spent a considerable of time writing laws. So uh, in in 1913, Johnson tried to argue that these coincide with the uh, existing law codes Graugaus and the old Gula things Luke, which are uh, Icelandic and Norwegian laws, and that they may have been sent to Orkney for adoption. But I think it's it seems more likely that that these attestations of law, law writing in, cha in chapter thirty one fifty two, then probably rep better represents the the author's historical thinking, the frame of mind that they had by the author. You know, perhaps still with perhaps still with Graugaus and Gula things log in mind because they were written uh, perhaps maybe a thousand years, not a thousand years, sorry, like a, a couple of hundred years earlier than Orkney the Saga originally was written. So that, that, they, were, that they were in existence, it, it kind of makes sense that it's going to be in the back of the author's mind, especially if you think it was written in Iceland, which is where Gragas was also written. Uh, I think, I also think, I think Barbara Crawford has also made the case that uh, in the case of Thorfinn, this lawmaking represents the onset of Christianity in Orkney. And that sort of conversion e equates to law and society in a way. In the case of Harkin, Orkney had already been converted for a considerable time. And it, it, it perhaps reflects the, author, the, uh, the saga's function, as uh, Edwin Cohen puts it, of the saga as a, an extended essay on, on comital rule and uh, reflecting on what makes a good ill, what makes a bad ill. And that, in this case, this reflects Halcon's, the, the, towards the end of Halcon's reign in Orkney. They, the, the, the saga notes of him being a, like a keen administrator and uh, his popularity began to grow. Whereas before he, he was quite an unpopular earl. He was known as uh, being quite harsh with things like taxation. And he's also quite famous for executing Magnus Erlitson, who would become Orkney's patron saint. You know, incredibly popular figure in Orkney. So, uh, as an earl, you could imagine he's not not particularly not particularly popular early on in his reign. Um, but this also kind of represents a, a turning point in the saga, where the the saga at the death of Magnus Erlinson for a good while, the saga has only been ruled by one familial dynasty. They're all all the all the elves are related in some way, but. Um, from then on, it's it's most of the Earls were descendants of Halcon Paulson until until later on in the saga, which I'll I'll, I'll get to. Uh, there's also two attestations of the of the phrase Lugmafer uh, in chapter 39 under 110. And uh, this interested me quite a bit because the a Lugmafer was an, an official position, uh, which it, in Iceland replaced the position of Lug Sugamafer which is uh, the law speaker of Iceland, which is in modern terms, perhaps kind of like a president's kind of figure in a way. And his, his responsibility was to recite law at uh, Icelandic assemblies and meetings. And when Iceland submitted to the Norwegian crown in the 13th century, the Lugmatha replaced the, the Luxugamatha. 
So uh, this the first the first attestation in the in the, in Orkney Saga in chapter thirty nine. It appears as a, as a first name. It, it, the, the saga states that, uh, excuse me, that uh, Lugman, son of King Guthruth of the Hebrides, was captured by King Magnus Berlegs uh, whilst he was on an expedition in the west. And the uh, the second the second attestation is a uh, uh, the saga describes a, a guy named Raven Lugmafer, so Raven Raven the law the lawman. Who was appointed as a steward as a steward in Caithness by Rubinvold Guthrithasson, who is a another another Hebridean king. Um, I'm not sure if there's a the relation between the two. This is quite quite a kind of opposite end of the saga, opposite ends of the saga. Um, but yeah, this this occurred because uh, I believe I believe one of the one of the later earls we had to reconquer Caithness. And it kind of upset the Scottish king, who who asked the king of king of the Hebrides to take it back, and he installed this installed this uh, this guy rather than Lugmather. So I don't know. If, I'm not sure if it's any significance in both cases. It's relating to a uh, Hebridean ruler. Um, I'm not entirely sure yet. I'm, I'm still I'm still quite undecided on that. And then in chapter fifty, there's a attestation of Sidor Ok Lug, uh, custom and law. Um, the context of this is that, as I, as I mentioned, how Paulson executed his, I think it was his, his cousin, Magnus Erlinson. And uh, when he was being executed, Earl Magnus said that the executioner could keep his clothes as part of uh, law and custom. And he was also mentioned that it's not fitting for a chieftain to be beheaded like a thief. And it's... It's not alluded to any further than that. But it's, in, it's an interesting addition to a particular episode of the saga that there's this recognition of existing customs. Um, yeah. So as for as when we mentioned Thorfinn's laws and this being linked possibly to the onset of Christianity in Orkney. Um, Barbara Crawford believes that it's part of a Christian narrative. Um, but in the in the case of Hal Compulsen, he also he's all, he's also uh, is described as feeling guilt for the death of his of his cousin later on, and he he takes a, he takes a trip to some famous religious sites. He goes to to Rome and he goes to the Holy Land, like to Jerusalem. He bathes in the River Jordan. So like, there's definitely some sort of religious consciousness in terms of the writing and this it all links in in some way and also the uh, uh, the support of a bishop might have import, been important in legal prosecutions um there's plenty of uh, cases of prosecutions in a, in a similar way like we have legal proceedings today and there's lots of examples in the Icelandic sagas uh i don't believe there's not really any cases of of lawsuits in the same way in Orkney and the Saga, but you know you notice on the examples I've put up, I've written a uh, potential lawsuits in chapter seventy six and chapter one hundred and three. So in the in the instance of chapter chapter seventy six, a uh, couple of chapters er, earlier, Earl uh, Earl uh, Halcom, um, a different a different Earl Halcom, I believed. But, but no, sorry, not Halcom, Earl Paul. Earl Paul was kidnapped by uh, Svein Arsleifsson and he was, uh, he was known to be quite uh, known to be a troublemaker and I'll, I'll come on to that. Uh, in, the, in chapter 76 uh, a, um, an individual reports this to the bishop that the Earl has been kidnapped and it suggests it could be Earl Lugenwald is doing because the, uh, these two Earls that, two Earls that ruled jointly uh, but the bishop rejected this and he said that you know, it, it couldn't be Earl Rugenwalder because he, well, what's the word? He, he, he just, he stuck up for him in a way. And this, con this contrasts to chapter 103, uh, where the same Earl Rugenwalder was killed in Caithness by Earl Harold's foster father, Thorburn, Thorburn, Thorburn Clerker. And uh, Earl Harold was warned by a, kin a kinsman of his that people would, think he had some sort of involvement if 
he didn't prosecute for Earl Rugenwalder's death. And it seems that he didn't have the support of a bishop like Rugenwalder did to, to watch his back in that way. And we know from fore reading that that same Earl Howarder would later blind and cut out the tongue of Bishop John in chapter 111. So kind of putting two and two together, you, you, can, you can see that perhaps having the support of the church might have been quite, quite a positive influence on your ability to remain in power as an earl. You know, it might be at the, the top of society, but there's definitely a lot of pressures that they would have come under from below, from the, uh, from the, sort of the farming classes. Uh, there seems to be a juridical awareness as well in Orkney the saga. Uh, so there's several there's several attestations of when the earldom was divided. The earldom was divided. Uh, sometimes it just had one earl to rule over the, the whole of the islands. Sometimes it had two earls who would rule jointly, and sometimes they separated the land and ruled separately. And uh, I think mean, J. J. Stoller Klaus in 1918, uh, he, he tried to devise some sort of way that the old might, the elder might have been divided. Um, but there's been there's been a lot of views about this being quite theoretical and not taking Shetland into account with any of the divisions. But uh, so in my view, I think it's it's interesting when you look at the saga and you consider what's not present rather than what is present, and the fact that the author doesn't signify any way, at least directly, that the islands might have been divided, perhaps might suggest it's not, it wasn't as important a detail for the author, just that, that there was, that there were divisions. And uh, so yeah, and, and you can see an example on the screen there. It's just one example, there's quite a few examples, that's just one. And you can see that in the case of Thorfinn and El Bruzi, they initially ruled ruled jointly together, and then they they had a falling out, and they they ended up moving separate ways and dividing the land between them. And um, there was a lot of uh, tension between. Well, it seems like there was a lot of tension between Scotland and Norway as well, and the sort of influence that they had that they they had, because there's there's no borders in this in this period, in the modern sense, like per se. Uh, but there's still a very much an awareness of like who's long belong to who. And you actually found, you actually find that Orkney and Shetland were earldoms of the Kingdom of Norway and held, held under kind of Norwegian influences there. But Caithness was actually part of the Kingdom of Scotland. Not and not Norway, so um, for any Earl, for any of the Earls that control Caithness as well, they'd have to uh, often answer to both the king, uh, the kings of Scotland and the kings of Norway, Norway at the same time. Uh, so, for example, in chapter eighteen, Earl Thorfinn refused to give his oath to King Olaf in Norway. So, and he, the reason he gave is that he was already the Scottish king's subject. Um, I think I think King King Malcolm of Scotland was his grandfather, um, and yeah. But but later on in the saga, in, in chapter one hundred nine, uh, late this is coming in terms of the the, to the time period. This is coming towards the later in the twelfth century when both Scotland and Norway were perhaps trying to exert more dominance over this part of the world, and there was no issue in chapter one hundred nine with the uh, Earl Harold Unger the Young traveling to both Norway and Scotland to receive the earldoms of both of those places. Uh, so this is, this is definitely sort of an aspect of uh, an aspect of the saga that you can read into. And like I was saying earlier about how close Orkney is to Scotland as well, but yet it's part of the Kingdom of Norway. There's, there's definitely practical implications there. Um, medieval hostageship is a, so, so a relatively new topic in, in academia, it's, it's not quite taken off yet regarding Scandinavia. Although there's a, there's a fair few studies that, that do exist. And, but it's, a, it's quite a thematical study that's consistent across many societies, like such as like Scandinavian society. It also bleeds into Irish 
Irish and Gaelic society and goes sort of continentally as well into France. There's a lot of legal studies for uh, hostage ship. And you, you had a, you had different types of hostage ship. And this can be this can be one way that you can measure a transgression of of honor and perhaps law, but technically, uh, but I'll, I'll get to that. So there, there are hostages who are given. So according to to Adam Costo, who's a uh, he sort of provided the probably the most defining work in the in this in this particular topic. He says that hostages who are given represent a form of agreement uh, by submission rather than the typical, what we would have typically thought of hostages being people taken against their will. And it's the idea that holding an important person made that, made that family subservient because of the perceived danger to the hostage. And there's also a strong sense of honor at stake as well, because uh, the, uh, Ad, Ad, uh, Adam Costo's coined this sort of concept of honorable captivity that the the hostage themselves were perceived as honourable because of the perceived danger, and equally, it was it was important for the captor to look after the hostage as well, make sure they were treated well, um, in terms of their honour. And so you can see, like on the quote on the screen I've given there, is a uh, linking like good treatment to the, the later concepts of chivalry. <coughs> Uh, excuse me. So, for example, oh, sorry, sorry, I've just uh, spilled my drink. <laughs> uh, no problems. Like in uh, in chapter nineteen, for example, uh, you see the, an agreement between King Olaf, Olaf or Haldson and Earl Brucey in in Orkney, and Earl Brucey was he was asked to leave his son behind as a mark of trust of this agreement. Uh, what was that chapter chapter nineteen? And it's note it's noteworthy as well that uh, that the son Rugenwalde Bruce's son, uh, the same the same who who originally built the church in in Orkney. Um, if you've been on one of Raggy's tours, uh, she, I think she'll probably would show you uh, what remains of the the original church. Uh, quite a cool, quite a cool little little gateway. And he Rugenwalde Bruce's son was well known in, in Orkney in the saga for being a a. a constant ally of Olaf for Haraldson. I was involved apparently with the, the Battle of Stikelstad, uh, where where he, he eventually died. And uh, Olaf for Haraldson, that is not Rugenwald of Bruceson. And uh, that led to his uh, him becoming a saint. Um, so yeah, and you, you can see you can see hostage being given as well in chapter 12, or a hostage being given in chapter 12, when uh, Olaf for Trigferson came to Orkney and forced Earl Sigurdur to convert to Christianity. And as part of this conversion, Sigurdur was forced to hunt to offer over his son as a hostage. Um, but he later died in, I think in Norway, uh, perhaps not much long later, according to the saga. And so in the saga it says, after which Sigurdur was Engi Luthskuldu. He was uh, no longer obliged to obey. And it's possibly a transgression on the part of Olaf for Haraldson that the hostage, for whatever reason he died, he died whilst under his protection. And the main thing is there was also that there was no more hostage in play to, to guarantee the agreement that they made for Sigurdur's conversion. Um, you see it in chapter 112 as well, later on, where the King William of Scotland actually blinded uh, Earl Howard Madathurson's son uh, because uh, they started fighting together. And uh, this, this, this blinding kind of parallels with uh, the instance in 1014 in England as well, when uh, King, well, not King then, Canute, the son of Svein Falkbeard, blinded and mutilated a load of hostages after after Svein Falkbeard died and King Aethelred was chosen as the King of England instead. And the, the, the mutilation hostages, uh, I believe, was, a, was a undertaken to instill a sense of shame for breaking the agreements and a very physical and traumatic form of shame that will stay there for the rest of the hostages' lives. Um, but on, on the other side of things, there were 
instances in the saga of kidnappings and people being forcibly taken. So this happens, as I mentioned, this happens in chapter 74 when Earl Paul was uh, kidnapped by Sveen Alfsleiferson. But when when he was kidnapped, the, the saga specifically notes that, uh, excuse me, that Earl Paul was looked after and he was treated quite well and almost got along famously. Um, it gives two versions. The other version is that maybe he was just taken, taken, blinded and assassinated. But, but the, the the fact that it mentions this this good treatment it reinforces this idea of honourable captivity as well. You see, you see, um, you see forcible kidnappings and forcible submission in uh, chapter chapter thirty eight and thirty nine as well, when uh, King Magnus Barefooter, the bare legs, uh, conquered Orkney and captured the earls Paul and Erlander. And they, they they later died whilst in captivity, which uh, again, they, they, what, for whatever reason they died, it doesn't it doesn't tell you, I don't think, um, but they died whilst under the, under that king's protection. So that potentially will also constitute as a as a transgression of uh, a transgression of honour. Um, there's also a case in chapter ninety one where Earl Harold is uh, captured near Thurso by King Aethelstan, and he's forced to give his allegiance as well. And uh, if you're going back, going back to that first bullet point where it says "and law" in a question mark, it kind of questioning. Um, uh, it's not not law exactly, but you have agreements between political parties, parties being, uh, you know, the king, kings of wherever, the earls of wherever. And that breaking such agreements is would constitute as a legal transgression. <laughs> another another aspect you see in Orkney Saga is the uh, the uh, uh, thing thing assemblies, and uh, in a way, this is almost the core basis of law in practice. And it's an aspect of study which brings together archaeology and place names, and you see it in Orkney Saga as well, so you see it in, in, in literature. And um, I've only really I've only really touched it briefly and briefly in my in my research. Uh, but thing, things were they were Viking assemblies where people met and made decisions and discussed other matters. In in Iceland it's it's described as a like a kind of kind of a democratic process. Whereas in, in Norway and Orkney, because you have the existence of an earls, it, it tends to be where they, they declare certain decisions that they made. And you had uh, different sizes of things as well, where you had uh, like regional things and like local assemblies. And the, the largest things were described as all things or law things. And this, I, I don't believe the size necessarily equated to how important they were but refers to the income of people that would turn up, I believe. You have more people that come up, it's more people you can get messages out to or get involved in political decisions as well. Uh, so you find in the, in the place name evidence, you find that uh, the thing, the ting aspects uh, survives and it's, it's compounded with other aspects, like a description of the assembly, where the assembly met. And they recorded relatively lately, generally speaking, like in the, the 15th century in a lot of cases or so. Uh, so, for example, in the case of, t of Tingwall or Tingwalls, because I believe there's, there's, a, there's a Tingwall in Shetland and there's a Tingwall in, in Orkney. Uh, these are attested as the name originally as Thing Thingvelia, uh, which is the, the assembly fields. Uh, the same form as Thingvelia in Iceland as well. So it's a relatively commonplace name. Um, like you see in Dingus How as well, is the in the description of the places that the How Old Norse Huygur is a How. As I think it's quite important that it was that it took place in an area that was uh, easy to see, easy to get to for uh, for practical reasons. There's a there's, there's some views that perhaps Maysau could have. Could have constituted a place of uh, thing assembly as well, 
Uh, I think this one's a little bit more uncertain. But it was a well, it was a well-known site, and it's it's all, it's mentioned in Orkney in the saga as well. So it's definitely recognised by the saga authors. Um, so at, at least in Orkney, and I believe in Norway, Norway and Norway and Iceland as well, you have these this uh, almost a social class called the bunder, and this kind of translates to to farmers, um, but specific, specifically. As a as a social class as well, and they would they would get involved with the the thing assemblies as well, where the Earls of Orkney would would launch and launch things to relay decisions to the main to the Boonder. But you find there's often a lot of um, influence by the Boonder as well, where they they could make complaints or they could put you know Earls under a certain amount of pressure as well. And there's a case, top of my head, I can't remember what chapter, in Orkney Ingsog with uh, Earl Einar, who is known as being a kind of harsh with his taxes. And the the, the saga notes that he had a, the Buddha chose a spokesman, uh, Thor Kerl the Fosterer, to, to speak up against Einar for them. So there's a, can, can be potentially some pressure from the Buddha as well. And... Uh, there's several attestations in in Orkney and the saga for things taking place. Uh, so, the first the first example I have on the screen there is uh, is Halvard Stegar. It it doesn't mention in the saga that this was a place of a thing, but it does mention that this was a particular field in near Stennis, which is in kind of the west main quite west mainland area. And it notes that there was uh, a fight between Earl Halvarfer and a, I think another contender. And Earl Halvarfer was killed there and that's how he gave his name to the field. And the reason I mention this is that there's a, there's a view that, that uh, some Thing sites, I think Thing Valley being one of them, I, maybe not Thing Valley, I'm not, I can't exactly, I can't entirely remember. That they they had this sort of origin where it was a site of people fighting, and somebody died, and that's how certain places may have originated. It's a it's, it's one it's one train of view, and um, yeah, yeah, there's all the attestation of the saga. I've I've only a, a few on the screen there, but there's more than that as well. In, chap in chapter 72, there's a, a loin thing, a secret thing, which was uh, which was organised by the Bunder of Westray uh, in opposition to Bugenwalder Coulson's onsets of being granted the earldom. And they were opposing his rule. And this is something that Bugenwalder had to, had to, had to quash. In, uh, in chapter 85, uh, Ulrugen, 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 Earl Rugenwalde summons a thing to to announce his departure to the Holy Land, as well, and you know announcing that he would leave his co-ruler, Old Harold or Madathason, in charge as well. And uh, in chapter ninety two, there's another example where King Aistine of Norway granted Earl under the title of Earl, and uh, Earl under summoned some of this thing to announce to announce this decision. And the the, Bo the Boonder stipulated that they would accept him as the Earl, but since this is whilst Earl Rugenwald is on crusade, that they would rule jointly when he returns, and that the Boonder would uh, would uh, would enforce this in some way if any Earl attempted to claim more than their share of the earldom. Uh, there's a there's a few women as well in Orkney Saga that I've mentioned, um, and in relation to transgressions as well. And these aren't necessarily transgressions of honour and morality, not necessarily by women, and not necessarily on women either. But uh, the women were viewed as recipients of the crime. But interestingly, a sexual crime against a woman also dishonoured that woman's family as well. So in a in a strange in a strange way, it's almost as if that uh, it's more of a it's more of a crime against the the family honor as as maybe as much as it is 
at, at personal affronts. So for, you see this in uh, say chapters one to two, where uh, when the, the saga is going through their, their legendary origins and uh, Gori is uh, kidnapped by Volfer. And as part of an agreement, the, the men of both parties stipulated that Gori would end up marrying, getting married to Volfer, and that Nor, uh, Gori's brother, would uh, marry Volfer's sister. And this is perhaps thinking back to the, the hostage ships sort of comes, came about so that neither party's familiarity is diminished and that neither party's subservient to the other. Uh, in chapter 93, you see something similar where Erlen der Unger, the young, uh, proposed marriage to Margareta, uh, who was Earl Harold's mother. Uh, but the marriage proposal was rejected by Harold. And uh, a result of this is that Erlander kidnapped Margareta and took her to the Brock of Musa, which you see, you see the image there on the, on the, on the screen. And uh, one, one view, one particular view is that abduction and, and rape were almost perceived as one of the, one is the same. And it's interesting too that the outcome of this would be like a dishonored family and subservience to the kidnapper which considering that it's the Earl's mother, that you can't have an Earl in charge somewhere who's subservient to a lesser, a lesser man, someone who's perhaps a boonder. Um, and eventually a settle came about so that eventually Erlander did manage to, to marry Margareta and that's how Elder and Erlander would become allies. I think this is down to, to uh, more practical reasons of coming to a settlement or anything, but uh, the Brock of Musa was besieged and there was just no way of getting in. Um, in chapter 92, you get a good uh, character, Guni, who's a slave, Spain, our slave for son's brother, is out outlawed as a result of uh, dishonoring the Earl. And what he did was he had a child, a child by Margareta. And uh, one, one line of thought is that this, this dishonors the Earl, but I, another reason is that as an Earl, you wouldn't want any, any contenders and that would be up and coming either. And uh, in chapter 94, you also have the case of Jon, Jon Ringer, uh, John Wing, impregnating Hulk and Carl's sister. And in this case, I think the, the Earl and the parties involved stipulated that they need to get married. And this contrast, this contrast to the case of uh, of Gunny being outlawed, but in in this case, you know, you'll you'll see that Jon Wenger and Halcon Karl are, are just simply they're boonder, so they're not in any particular positions of power. So I, I suppose in these instances, it, it's it's not so much a political thing, but a, a social issue. Um, in the saga, you do see two landowners as well, the who are women. Um, at least from what from from my reading anyway, I don't know if perhaps I've missed missed any. But there, in chapter fifty four, there's a uh, Frakuk, he's a landowner in Caithness, and uh, Sutherland as well, I believe, and she was a uh, widowed in chapter fifty four. And generally throughout the medieval period in medieval Europe, you tend to find that widows can be quite powerful women because they inherit their their ex husband's land and estates, and they're almost almost rise to quite a strong social class. And um, it's the same, the same Frakuk who the next chapter makes uh, a, a magic poison shirt for uh, Earl, Earl Harold, which kills him. Or Earl, was it Earl? I can't, I can't remember. I mean, it might have been Earl Powell and I think Harold got jealous and put the shirt on. And this is, a, this is followed by a genealogical description of Frakuk's offspring. So the fact that this saga gives this, this genealogy at the end of that chapter, uh, notes that this is quite a powerful character yet to come in the saga. And you do see that later in chapter 63, that Frakuk allies with Rugenvelder Coulson after, just after he's granted the Elden. And it almost has to, he has to take the Elden by force. He gets a bit of, 
resistance on his onset of his rule. And he allies, he allies with Frakuk. He, she, she, uh, the, pl the plan was that they would, I think she would take take Orkney by the south whilst Rugenvalda would come to Orkney via Shetland. Uh, the, other, the other landowner in, in the Orkney saga is a, uh, in chapter 67 describes a, a farmer called Ragnar. And she was a landowner on North Ronald Say and Pape. And she has she has a role in the saga as well, where she tries to convince Earl Powell to unlaw Svein Oslaferson, which uh, which he he doesn't go through with, and which uh, I'll talk about in a little while. But probably was the right call, rather than keeping him outlawed. And uh, one more thing to mention here is that there, there is an instance of rape in Orkney in the saga, in in chapter hundred. It's not and it's not a, a specified case, but this character Thorbjorn Kloker is is noted as committing committing the crime of rape whilst in Caithness, and it's perhaps perhaps in the saga to maybe demonstrate Caithness as a as an area of higher lawlessness perhaps than Orkney, but I think mainly it's to uh, to highlight this character's tendency for a lack of moral a lack of morals, and transgressing the bounds of moral normativity in that respect. And uh, this this sort of aspects of of the uh, social values extends to, to the, the wounds of Maysow as well. Uh, so, like in in Orkney Saga, for example, Margareta is described as Svarker, which translates kind of as a like how like howty, with a meaning of I think proudness and perhaps uh, perhaps arrogance or superiority. And this contrasts with the uh, the Barnes Dine inscription on the screen there. Inge Björg, the fair widow, many a woman has gone stooping in here. A great show off, Erdinger. So this uh, it contrasts with the, the Mikil Oflauti, a great show off. And um, it's, and in the in the attestation of Orkney Inga saga, perhaps rather than a value ju judgment, it's perhaps reflecting on on her role in the saga, as I've, as I've discussed in the previous slide, of uh, she gets kidnapped and she also has a child by by Goodney. Um, but it could it could even it could even maybe carry the connotation of victim blaming in a way. Um, if you think to, to the case in medieval Ireland, you have the case of a queen called Derbfgale, who was uh, who was kidnapped by a, a rival clan. And in the Norman sources, the, the, the Norman English actually blame Derbfagel for being kidnapped. And this, this leads to a series of events which eventually end up with the Norman English taking over control of the island. So just, just, just a line of thought, but it also, it also just reflects her, her role in the saga as well. And uh, as for social, social attitudes concerning women as well, you see that in the Bar's 10 inscription, you have a thorny south Helgi raced. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and these are uh, these interpret these interpreters had the, the sort of uh, it sort of denotes the the invocation of sexual submissiveness. So and you see you see that in the first inscription as well, where the uh, I think Michael Barnes in interprets this perhaps as a as a the the a woman going stooping as a uh, invoking sexual submissiveness. Um, in this case, it might also just refer to how low the entrance of Maze How is, possibly as well. And uh, now it's, this is sort of more the, the storytelling aspects of opening the saga. Um, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole of opening the saga, as you, as you can imagine, is kind of has a mix of history and literature. So it's, it's all, it's all storytelling in a way as well. But these are definitely uh, aspects that the author has put in as uh, contributors to the narrative. It's not, a, not an aspect of legal custom, customs per se, but a, a phenomenon in saga literature. These characters are used by authors to trigger narratives. So uh, Short Butler, Joanne Short Butler in her 2016 thesis, she notes that characters are labelled as Oyapnathan men because of something they're yet to do. 
almost like some sort of old Norse spoiler. And when you come across these characters, you know they're going to cause some sort of trouble. And uh, she categorised them into, in when they're when they're introduced as Oyapnathamen, they have these these different roles that they may play in the saga. And uh, you, in opening the saga, you find that some certain characters perhaps almost fit into a category, and you, sometimes they fit into to multiple cat categories. And this is perhaps down to the, sort of the the episodic nature of the saga and the the overlapping lifetimes of certain characters as well. You know, you don't have a, you don't have a main character as such in opening the saga. It's, it's, a, it's a saga about the earls. If an earl dies, the saga moves on to next earl. Um. So the but the so that might be a reason why certain categories might overlap in a certain way. And uh, on the bottom of the screen there, you also see Keith Rooter's uh, spectrums of normativity as well. And, and uh, these are what I was saying about earlier about the the spectrums of honor, law, and moral normativity, um, which are, seem it seems like quite a quite a useful way of of measuring when a transgressive deed is taking place. And that 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 quote there essentially says that there's there is an existence of a variation between what is good and bad, and this this may actually vary from society to society. And the interesting thing about Oyapnathamed is that you can take them in their different societies to to measure when a transgressive act is taking place. Uh, so just a uh, sort of passing passing the. Uh, the, f the phrase of it, the uh, Oyapnathamedon, it, it translates as an uneven or an, in an inequitable man. And when you, if you read that in a saga, it doesn't exactly sound like it translates well. Sometimes it's translated as uh, a bully. Uh, and another, quite an accurate sort of consideration of Papu that they're the troublemakers is how they're often translated to. And in Orkney Saga, I found that these can be these can be major Oyapnathamen or minor Oyapnathamen. And I believe that the, the major ones are in the saga to provide some sort of challenge to the earls. And I'm thinking back to Cohen, Cohen's view that the, the saga may be an extended essay on comital rule of what makes a good earl and a bad earl. And then almost it's almost as if it seems like some sort of social hierarchy of transgressive characters where you have the major Oyapnathan men who interact with the earls, and you have the minor Oyapnathan men who interact with the major Oyapnathan men. Uh, so, the main, what well, I was, I would say, the main Oyapnathan mother in Ogning Saga, Svein Arslaifson, he uh, perhaps comes into the category of Oyapnathan men who define an entire narrative. And, uh, like, so, Patrick Topping, for example, has, also, has even noted that certain aspects of the saga concern Sweden more than they concern the Earls. And uh, Judith Jesh has also described, described the saga as deriving from a Svenian tradition of eyewitness events. And so it's, it's fair to say that he con constitutes uh, a, a main protagonist in the saga. But he's also perhaps described as, anach as an anachronistic character um that typically he's he seems like quite a viking character he likes to go on on raids but this is in a period perhaps later in the saga after after the viking age where the cream of society is moving towards a, a more cultured way of life than than a culture of of leaving on on raiding expeditions so uh, he provides a challenge for both Earls Pohl and Rugenvelder Coulson. And uh, in chapter 66, uh, pa Earl Pohl promised to add to, to uh, Svein's honour. And uh, shortly afterward, he, he actually kills Svein, Svein Breastrope, Breastrope, and he fled to, the, fled to the Hebrides and was, as a result of this, was outlawed by, by Pohl. Uh, he later returned to Orkney and kidnapped Earl Pohl, like, as of as I've mentioned, um, so perhaps coming under the category of killing of, of uh, killing a maid character, and maybe of 
altering the social setup up of the saga, but with himself playing a role rather than without himself playing a role. As I say, this this certain overlap of these characters' lifetimes. Um, and so, uh, Svein Arslaifsson, in this case, was the end of Earl Pohl. And then in the case of Rugenwalder, for example, Rugenwalder managed the challenge of maintaining social order a lot better than Powell did. And he balanced in the, the need for maintaining order amongst the Bunda, whilst also not putting oneself in danger of, of, uh, of an away up nothing other. So whilst Powell outlawed Svein, uh, which he was more than well entitled to do because he, he committed a crime, but Rugenwalder was criticised by the Bunda in Chapter 95 for, for not outlawing him. Um, he would, Rugenwalder would have been expected to prosecute for, for Paul's kidnapping because Paul was Rugenwalder's cousin. Um, but this, this charge was rejected. Um, there's also a case in Chapter 82 when Rugenwalder compensated Thorbjorn Klerker, who complained that Spain didn't share, share loot fairly enough after the Viking expedition. And Rugenwalder himself paid compensation to Thorbjorn for him to drop the matter. So you can see that this is an instance of successful rulership, whereby Rugenwalder was able to, to mitigate the, the transgressive deeds of a certain character into something which, which Keith Root has described as negotiably non-normative, uh, by which you know, the, the, the society can come to accept his transgressive behaviour in a, in a sort of way. Oh, I think I missed, missed a slide. Yes. Uh, the other other major Oyapnathamath in the saga is Thorbjorn Klerker. And uh, he's, uh, he's, he's known for almost bringing, bringing the saga to a climax by, by, by killing what is probably the closest thing to the main character, uh, Rugenwalder Coulson. Uh, Thorbjorn, the, the, re the reason this came about is Thorbjorn complained to Rugenwalder after Rugenwalder's retainer killed. Thorbjorn's follower, and no settlement was made of the killing. Afterwards, he Thorbjorn made, committed loads of crimes in Caithness, secretly returned to Orkney, and killed the retainer. Yeah, for, for, for this reason, he was outlawed. Um, he overstepped the, the legal boundaries in the pursuit of justice, but also morally poor because of the rapings, like, I, like I've mentioned. And eventually, the, the action comes to a climax in Caithness, where Rugenwalder was fat uh, fatally wounded by, by Thorbjorn's follower. And so you see the contrast again with Earl Paul and Svein Arslaifsson, where they both outlawed a character, outlawed an Oyat Nathamatha, and it, it, it's come to, to bite them in the backside a little bit. And uh, he, he provided a slightly different challenge to Harold Madatharsson as a slightly as a, a social annoyance regarding the spectrums of normativity, where, whereby Rugenwalder died by Thurbion in chapter 103. And Thurbion was asked, asked Thurbion asked Harold for forgiveness for the death of Rugenwald. But Harold was split because Thurbion happened to be old Harold's foster father. So he was both morally and honorably inclined towards Thurbion, but at the same time, he was expected to, to do something about the fact that he's he's killed Earl Rugenwalder, uh, Rugenwalder Coulson. So whatever the outcome, really, things wouldn't turn out well for Harolder. He would either sacrifice honour and morals or law, regardless of what happens. And um, the other side, we have uh, Minor Oyup Nathan Medden. Um, how are we for time, time Raggy? Uh, I think... Uh, uh, it's gone, gone for quite a while. Would you like me to, to, to fasten up a little bit? Um, yeah, we're, we're over one hour now, so we should maybe try and come towards a conclusion. Yeah, I, I'll, try to, I'll try to wrap up, uh, wrap up more quickly. Um, Thank but you. You, you have the, you have the, uh, the, the minor up, all up and other men who interact on the major ones, and like in these cases, in, in, in relation to the, the spectrums of normativity. So, for, in, for instance, in the in the case of Margather, Mar, Mar, Margather, Margather killed Proaldi of Wick, a, bon, a Bondi, and he raided Caithness of Svein. Uh, Ulf Rugenwalder went to to Lamberburg in Keep Chieftains, where Margather and Svein were, were hiding out, 
and Svein refused to hand over Margather. He was perhaps morally inclined towards him because he's described as his fialagi, which is a, a comrade. But at the same time, he's also transgressing the legal bounds because of the crimes that they committed together in Caithness. So again, with Svein, you have this little conundrum where whatever the outcome, he's going to overstep the bounds of some spectrum of normativity. You also have the uh, phenomena of, of, of Stop and Medan in the Orkney Saga as well. I noticed these are characters who are all either earls, an earl's sons, or king's sons, or future earls. And these, these are defined by Joanne Short Butler's characters with characters with an overabundance of a certain quality, but perhaps function similarly to the Oyapnatha Medan. It could be a co codecological difference where they could be could be one and the same. In a sense that it could be just the way that the original saga author wrote them down, that all the upstop man men seem to occur within the first 35 chapters of the saga, and then from then on you have all you have Natha Medan. But I do think they do function differently. Um in all these in all these cases, these characters seem to create political rifts in, in some way. And when you apply root to spectrums of normativity, in all these cases, you see that the ills the yields can't really transgress because they are the live or they can't can't transgress the legal normative because they are the living living embodiment and representatives of their societies. So it's almost as if they define in a way, I think, what what's what is normal, because it does vary from society to society. And so, for example, uh like you these characters do make political rifts in chapter three, for example, you have the sons of the legendary access ancestors of the Earls of Orkney making attacks on the sons of, of Noor, um, linking the, the legendary ancestors of the kings of Norway and the Earls of Orkney together. And uh, you see as you see differently, perhaps in the case of Halcon Paulson in chapter 35, is what uh, one of the upstoppermen in chapter 34 creates a political rift. But uh, he's introduced as an upstop matter again in the following chapter. And this, this perhaps reflects his function similar to an Oyap Natha Matha. Um, Havod Madoth, Madothosum. I'm going, to, I'm going to slightly contradict myself because Havod Madothosum is an earl, but he's also described as literally, literally a Yapnatha men. So he is an, an Oyap Natha Matha. And uh, I think I, I believe the reason for this is he, he's functioning as a major Oyabnathamatha, whose role his role in saga is to provide a little literary challenge for the earl, for an earl. And it's implied that when he took part of when he took control of the earldom, it the saga does note that that he would always come second in the decision made uh, the decision making tool of Rugenvelder, and that he would be subservient to him. And the reason he is an Oyabnathamatha is because he as I, as I mentioned, he, he, he's forsaken Thorbjörn, who killed Earl Rugenbelder. It was the, uh, the same conundrum that he would transgress either moral or law, regardless of the outcome that he made. And, you know, you're thinking, thinking that uh, he had to forsaken his, his foster father, Thorbjörn. And, and in this period, fosterage, according to Adam Costco, Costo, it creates a sort of meaningful social social bond, and can be so. This decision almost is morally ambiguous. And uh, you also you could also um, notice that uh, he's not an Oyabnatha Mahatha. He is literally a Yabnatha man. And uh, this is this is actually mentioned by Joanne Short Butler. Is if you have the phrase sort of. Engi Yapnathamatha or Eki Yapnathamatha rather than O Yapnathamatha, it tends to refer to men of high status. And he is at high status because he's the Earl. Uh, and to the, the final, se final section of my talk, um, there, there are instances of outlawry in Orkney Masaga, and it is outlawry, generally speaking, is symptomatic, symptomatic of the presence of O Yapnathamatha. But 
there are surprisingly few outlaws in the saga compared to how many transgressive transgressive characters there are. And again, this is this is a, a case case by case basis. Um, and there doesn't seem to be an enacted law code for for anywhere in Scotland, really, for at least where the Norse uh, literature is concerned. But for example, you see when Sweden Auslivsen was outlawed in chapter 66 for killing Sveen Brustrup, it wasn't specifically for the killing, but for fleeing the scene after making a killing. And this is a detail which is, is uh, quite similar to an attestation in Graugaus at what constitutes a murder of not coming clean with the deed that you've done. There's a perhaps uh, reflecting perhaps an, an area of an area of influence in in Iceland, and reflecting on that Icelandic authorship as well. Uh, you can also understand outlawry in terms of implicit and explicit. And in simple terms, explicit outlawry is when somebody is is outlawed, whereas implicit outlawry is when the, the term outlaw outlawry isn't used and we can recognize outlawry by narrative features instead whereby a character character isn't isn't officially outlawed but perhaps shows similar features to an outlaw um, and I'll get to that I'll get to that now where in Iceland you have this idea of skullgangur, uh, which is forest going which is full outlawry status and in, in Iceland, it's, it's, it was almost like a death sentence where it was illegal in Iceland to interact with these characters or to give them help or anything like that. So they, they essentially became prisoners in Iceland. And uh, they are called Skogarmeden because they are associated, they're associated with forests, almost like a, an, a, a landscape specifically denoting outlawry. But of all the, of all the cases of uh, explicit outlawry in Orkney Saga, you see that all the all tends to use the use the term utlagi, which is a it would be translated as an outlaw. And there's a there's a there's a few cases of this, like in uh, like when uh, like before I mentioned that uh, Gunni impregnated Margareta, and he was he was outlawed as a result of that. And then there's this this other concept of lesser outlaw outlawry in uh, in the Icelandic sagas. You see this in the term fjörbuisgarthar. Um, which it, did, it denotes a, a period of temporary exile. After, and in Iceland, this was a this would have been a period of, uh, of costing them three years, but with the aim of rehabilitation. Hence, the the image of backpackers. It's it's been likened to to sort of foreign travels in a in a sort of way. And you see this in chapter thirty five when Halcon Paulson is he's not outlawed, but he. He creates the political rift between his father, the Earl, and his uncle, the, the other Earl. And he was asked to leave, and he was asked not to stand in the way of settlement, and that he leaves the islands at Sydney, so, uh, Sydney which is just for the present. So definitely a strong sense of temporary leave from the islands. And if you read, if you read Alexander Taylor's version of, of uh, his translation, he attempts to date it, the aspects of the saga. I don't know how accurate the dating is, but by his reckoning, this is a period of about five years. So a little bit longer than the three years of Fjordburg's Garford, but there's still a strong sense of temporary exile. And uh, one way of recognizing implicit outlawry is by landscape features and the associations there. And we can make the connection because of concepts in Iceland, like Skoganga. And it's interesting that there's no, they don't use the phrase Skoganga in Scotland. And it's, it's almost ironic that they use the word Skoganga in Iceland, where there are typically not many trees. And they don't use it in Orkney, for which Scotland has many, many trees. And uh, I, believe, I believe the general view is that in Iceland, it's a term that was brought over from Norway. There's a very heavily forested landscape there. And so you see, for example, you see a, a case of an implicit outlaw in chapter 40, when King Magnus, King Magnus uh, Barefooted uh, took Magnus Erland, Erlandson with him on his expedition to the west in the Irish Sea. Uh, 
he escaped and he, he tried to hide in some woods and Kick Magnus attempted to use Spore Hunter tr uh, tracking dogs to try and find him, and which can, can kind of allude to the, the idea of him being hunted in a way. And also uh, po probably a Lucia an idiom in Old Norse literature, a vera or hunda chlothi, uh, to be out of the, the dog's bark, which is a, an idiom of being out of trouble away from the sound of dogs. So you see a Lucia, that's the, the, the fact that he's... He's literally tracked by dogs in some woods. So I, I would say this is it, it doesn't it doesn't denote that he is outlawed, but he doesn't return to Orkney for the rest of the time that King Magnus is in power. And you can see this strong association between being on on the run and being associated with forests. And then on the other side of this uh, this landscape thing. Do you, you have the landscape that's that Orkney and Shetland they're, they're both archipelagos and uh, Marion Pro, Marion Provers has, has looked into this uh, into this a little bit and it's like small islands were not exactly ideal places for outlaws because if you've been to Orkney you'll know you, you can see quite a long way into the distance there's not exact there's not exactly much room to hide anywhere and you see that in chapter eight of Orkney Saga where Einar, Earl, Ein, Earl Torf Einar searched the, line, the islands for fugitives and the, the saga describes him seeing something bobbing up and down in the water way in the distance, which turned out to be Halfdan half Haulegur, a uh, long leg, who was a, a particular son of a Norwegian king who tries to, tried to invade the islands. Um, this, but this contrasts as well to the Kununga saga and Islanda saga, the Icelandic sagas and the King sagas, where occasionally Orkney is mentioned as a place where outlaws from Iceland and Scandinavia would uh, would perhaps go to when when they have to leave as well. So yeah, just to you know to quickly summarise, I believe that the approaches were strongly help us to understand saga texts such as Orkney and the saga. And especially in a text which has a lot of external influence as well from Iceland and Norway, and it's, it's so close to Scotland as well, it's got a lot of Scottish influences. But also understanding Orkney Inga saga within the many studies that have taken place about the Icelandic sagas, and they're not necessarily the same, but there's definitely still a lot of similarities. And all of this, all of these legal approaches definitely support Edwin Cohen's view that Orkney Saga was an extended essay on cometal rule. You know, and the, the case of the Oyap Nathamedan definitely show this because you have cases where an earl has made a good decision or a bad decision regarding or whether to outlaw someone or not, for example, and it's it's been their downfall, their success as an earl. So uh yeah, so sorry I uh went over a little bit raggy thank you very much well done um yeah I, I haven't had any questions in the chat so far but carol says she's sorry she has to go but she says i have thoroughly enjoyed this topic and hope i can hear more no can hear the end via the recording and you can carol <laughs> yes a note of appreciation there um I don't think we can spend very much time on questions now, but if anybody has anything, a short or quick question, now is your chance. Is there an overlap between fostering and hostage taking, says Steve, and, and I remember discussing this topic with with a former student of mine as well, Charlie Allway, who was studying fostering, and he, he said the same thing. And even marriage, like when you see, for example, Earl Ronald Kali Colson's sister is uh, sentenced <laughs> to marry um, a person that Ronald has had a feud with. Uh, so yeah, Steve's observation there overlap between fostering and hostage taking thoughts snake yeah it's definitely an overlap i mean if you, if you if you go into a study of fostership 
it's it, it takes place in the same studies as medieval hostageship as well. It's the same same sense of someone being offered as part as part of agreements, um, albeit not exactly a, a particularly contractual agreement in the same way exactly, but also. Whereas in the cases I've discussed of, of hostages being given, the, 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 the almost on practical cases like when when Sigurtha was forcibly converted to Christianity, or where Earl Brucey had to had uh, was making agreements with the King of Norway. In Fost in Fosterage, I think this is a a lot more of a of a planned thing, and is also also an import, an important cultural aspect for the upbringing of of one's offspring as well and i think it's generally generally quite quite important in scandinavian society that there's a right match between uh, the foster father and the foster the foster re i'm not sure well, i don't know how you how you would say it um uh, yeah it's, it's important in terms of familial 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 honor particularly Thank you. One one question that came up in my mind was, how is Magnus Erlinson an Ovstoppa mother? You had on the slide that the sons of Paul and Erlen were overbearing men, but Magnus is generally celebrated as a saint. So, in which way was he an Ovstoppa mother? Uh, hang on, I find the I find the slide back up. Um. Upst uh, Upstoffer Mather. Yeah. Um, you say, you say Mag Magnus Erlinson. Yeah, I thought this slide said the sons of Paul and Erland were mentioned as Upstoffer Mather. Oh yeah, the yeah the Paul yeah the sons of Paul and Erland are the yeah in the in the saga. I believe, I think my my knowledge might be a little bit vague. One of the sons was Magnus Erlander. I believe it may, maybe I've got an error. Maybe they were both sons of Earl Powell, but there was another, there was another son who was not quite as mentioned as much. I think maybe he dies shortly after. I could, I could probably quickly check that one. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. It just made me curious. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of notes of appreciation here in the chat. Um, Thank you so much for a very interesting talk. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, says Carl Christian. Also, Isabel, thank you so much. Very much enjoyed. And Lexi says, lots of food for thought there. Thank you. I think actually we need to stop now because we've got long over time, but this has been brilliant. Thank you for sharing your research with us. Um, and also to say that we've got talks coming up. Um, on Wednesday, I'll give a talk about Earl Thorfinn, the mighty. So that's the next talk that you can go to and see the program for how to sign up for that. I'll stop recording now.